are here today because we have been start zooming to not then see more than just the end because that, that was required for sharing your talk with online people so we were successful so that's great <laughs> but it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Stephen Laval to you so uh, uh, if you check his uh, web page actually you will see that uh, Steve is both a uh, student and professor at the University of Oulu. He's a lifelong student, right? I'm yeah, right and uh, also, uh, before that, he was a uh, professor at the University of uh, Illinois, Urbana Champaign, as far as I remember. And yeah, I won't go through the war versus of Steve, but he has held some very important position, including in the industry. So he was the early founder of uh, Oculus as well. And I think we talked uh, during CNAF where you were there. And as far as I remember, you designed this motion, HMD motion sensing system and how to filter the signal so that you would reduce the latency and uh, have less motion sickness. And this is what really what made uh, the Oculus uh, successful. Uh, Steve is also known to have worked quite a lot on motion planning and uh, he has uh, he has designed some of the most important algorithms that are still used in the field actually when i was phd students i was implementing some of his algorithms and to apply them to computer animation when we talked at the time and uh yeah so i think that uh i should stop talking and just let Steve show us what are the new direction for his research. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Everyone hear me okay? All right, very happy to be here. Um, as Julian said, I, I attended the first uh, SCA back in 2002. So, so it's nice to be back, it's been a while. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to give a talk that's just kind of storytelling, going over lots of things that I've done over the years. So I wasn't quite sure what might stick with this audience. So, so, uh, so I present a lot of things, and maybe there's something for everyone, hopefully. Um, so where do I start? Well, back in the early 80s, I, I lived in video arcades, and I, and I thought, um, especially like Donkey Kong and Tron, and uh, got into programming as a teenager and wanted to make video games. Um, instead, went into like robot motion planning, which seemed pretty close in a lot of ways, eventually. So um, four sort of stages of my background, I'm mainly electrical engineer by training, uh, up to PhD. Um, then um, I, was, I was at Stanford for a couple of years working with uh, Jean-Claude Leton, Leo Gibas, and Reggie Botwani. Then, uh, then I was, uh, started as a professor, mostly at the University of Illinois, working in robotics, then had a chance to be an early founder of Oculus. Um, and then after that, that went by really fast, the company was less than two years old when it was bought and then did some um, angel investing and advising of companies. And I was also a vice president in uh, Huawei for, for a while, spent a lot of time in China doing product related things. I was in the product division, actually, not the research one. So it was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, you know, one group earns money and one group burns money. <laughs> we won't say which is which. Um, <laughs> So starting in 2018, I um, moved to Northern Finland because I just like it there and uh, started a group called Perception Engineering Lab. We have about uh, 20 or so people and I'm co-directing it with Professor Timo Oyla, who's a local professor there who helps make my life wonderful because I can't figure out all of the Finnish things that I'm supposed to figure out. So, so we're having a good time there. Um, so going back to motion planning, as Julian said, I'm very interested in, in motion planning, sometimes called the piano movers problem. And it does have this kind of feeling like I wanted to make you know, video game characters autonomously back back when I was a teenager, but um, I don't think I ever had the artistic skill or talent or patience to make things look really, really cool, but I at least liked the algorithms parts and mathematical parts. So path planning is just trying to get from point A to point B in a configuration space of some kind, high dimensional, what's high, I don't know, it could be three, four, five, a hundred, a thousand maybe, and um, the algorithms must compute a path that goes from one point to another while avoiding collision. So there's collision checking going on. So we can sort of see this blob as some kind of gods looking down, but the algorithms can't. They can just sort of take steps. And uh, they're, they're actually kind of exploring the world around them, but it's um, the, the models are completely given though. They just can't generate this kind of high dimensional picture. Um, so this thing I, I introduced in 1998 called uh, Rapidly Exploring Random Trees, and then wrote a series of papers with James Kuffner 
Um, the idea is to uh, pick points at random in the space and then grow a, a tree that's exploring by, by looking at the, like trying to find the nearest point on the tree and then extending it a bit towards the random point and doing this over and over again. And it makes these nice space filling stochastic fractals. And then you start one tree from the initial, one tree from the goal, and you'd also try to get them to connect. So, so that's kind of the basic idea. And then this motion planning algorithm or others similar to it have been used quite a bit. These are 20 year old kinds of pictures, but they were used a lot for um, computer aided um, design, uh, virtual prototyping, um, also for in actual robotics applications. This is a virtual view, but this is actually used in a real, uh, pl a real plant. So, so automatically planning the motions of the robots in, in an assembly plant. Um, of course, for virtual humans or digital actors, that was the main uh, PhD thesis of James Kuffner. Um, I got to know him really well when he was a PhD student at Stanford and I was a postdoc. And so we had a great friendship and collaboration that came out of it. I think that's Marcelo Kalman's work there. There's a few other works here in this book. Um, yeah. Oh, I've forgotten who's that one is now. I'm so bad. Manfred was the author of this one. I'm sorry? Manfred. Oh, Manfred. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Yep. <laughs> great. Exactly. And this one is James's. Yep. Um, and then these things got adapted to humanoid robots as well. So uh, James Kaufman especially brought a lot of that to the University of Tokyo. There's uh, Kagami-san, one of the researchers there at the time. So um, tell, the, tell the, the humanoid to go pick up an object off of the floor and it figures out all of the motions automatically. And there's molecular uh, computational biology applications as well. Um, for myself personally, I got more and more interested in the problem where there's differential constraints so you need to go from point A to point B, but you may have kinematics that you have to satisfy. People have been talking about in the earlier session today or um, dynamics, momentum and things like that. In fact, that was the original idea when I came up with the RRT was that I wanted to figure out um, how can you explore a space without having to solve a lot of two point boundary value problems by connecting the dots. You can connect the dots very easily if you have only collision constraints, but if you don't, then you have to apply inputs or actions to the system and then go with the flow. So I was very interested in this planning with differential constraints for quite a number of years. And the original RRT, so the, the, the um, presentation backwards in the sense that going back, comparing to the previous RRT, you just have this thing called a local planner that just extends the tree by applying some actions. Like if you're driving a car, then you step on the accelerator or the brake, you can turn the steering wheel, and then you go with the flow of the system in some way. And that was the original motivation. Most of the RRT uses are for without differential constraints, and that's where most of its success has been. But this was the kind of reason I was, the thing I was mainly thinking about at the time. We just need better metrics and motion primitives, which many people continue to work on. Then I decided to get a little crazy, and, and the, the, the random part of RRT, I decided to attack directly and say, you know, I think randomness isn't really helping much. Uh, people often claim Monte Carlo methods are beating the curse of dimensionality. And I started to attack that pretty heavily. And I, and I think irregularity and randomness actually is making things worse. It's just very easy because you have a pseudo random number generator in whatever programming language you pick up. But what you really need is some kind of dense sequence um, so that every open set is touched in the space. And there's some sets, some of these sequences are more uniform than others. In fact, random uniform sequences are not very uniform because they put too many points in some places and not enough in others. This is more uniform. And what's really wrong with regularity, other than when you see it, you start thinking about number of points per axis, but that's not a fault of the, the samples themselves. So I did a lot of like, let's say, de-randomizing or, or coming up with deterministic alternatives for these kinds of things. <clears throat> I wrote a big book, um, it's free online, Cambridge University Press way back in 2004, 2005, let me keep it online so it still stays online. But I wrote all kinds of motion planning things in there, other kinds of planning. <clears throat> then I got really interested in where does the information come from? So in the piano movers day, um, you would have a complete geometric model of everything, like a CAD model. And then robots can do SLAM. So they have simultaneous localization and mapping. They build pretty good maps these days. But I really wanted to think about um, what can you get away with minimally? So if, you, if the robot is using sensors to explore its environment and you wanted to solve some tasks, um, what does it actually need to have in its brain? Does it need a complete map? Does it need to have coordinates of you know, X, Y orientation and so forth? Or can it just get away with something much smaller? And so I developed a kind of framework called, inf uh, called information spaces. And uh, this was inspired largely by work going back to um, dynamic game theory or sequential game theory, um, back to von Neumann and Morgenstern. Um, <clears throat> the basic idea, if you, you want to look you know, the kind of thing people do in control theory or in robotics, they very often have some big state space, like the configuration space of a robot. 
or uh, maybe it has phase variables as well that correspond to velocity that's encoded in this. And then the idea is use your sensors, estimate the state, and then figure out what action to take based on that. And all the time you have state feedback, that's the idea. So you kind of decouple the sensing problem from the uh, control or actuation problem. And I thought it's much more interesting to just feed information directly back. So just um, based on the information you have, take action. Maybe the information is only um, the current sensor reading. Then it's just pure sensor feedback. Maybe that's all you have. You have no memory. You can make a memoryless agent. There's something called Breitenberg vehicles, a whole bit of book on these things that people have looked at that are just pure feedback, pure sensor feedback systems. So they just take whatever the output of the sensor is and connect it to motors. There's a lot of little hobby kit kinds of robots that do that. But what about more complex things? So, um, so estimation is sufficient, but not necessary. You don't have to estimate the entire state exactly. Um, so some things that were unusual about this is that I'm always telling people that even if you have perfectly accurate sensors, um, you still have huge amounts of uncertainty because you're not measuring everything. We might imagine a big state space that corresponds to everyone's configuration in this room and maybe their velocities as well, though most velocities are zero right now. Um, and, and, then, um, um, and then I have a sensor that just measures the distance to the wall in the direction that I'm facing. So there's a lot of uncertainty. It did not measure all of this extra stuff. Many people think uncertainty in sensing is just some noise, Gaussian stuff or other fancy, maybe mixtures of Gaussians, but most of the uncertainty comes from this many to one mapping. And that's something I want to emphasize a bit today. Um, discrete or continuous doesn't matter so much. And I'm talking about information spaces, not information theory. Claude Shannon's information theory actually came later than von Neumann's notion of information. So this, the notion I'm talking about today is about hidden information, things that are not hidden states. You've seen maybe hidden markup models and things like this. It's more of hiding information, not counting bits. But you can put them both together or you can keep them separate. They're quite orthogonal topics. Um, to give you some ideas, we started building um, um, different kinds of filter, filtering or sensor fusion methods that involve minimalism. We had a big um, project in the US funded by DARPA. We had a, about a dozen people on it for several years. It was an $8 million project that involved about half mathematicians and half uh, engineers, uh, including roboticists and control theorists. And we were developing kind of foundations of sensing with minimalism. So you may have a number of robots that move around carrying, let's say, uh, panoramic cameras. And they want to count the number of these bodies moving around, red ones and blue ones and green ones. So there's different categories. Um, so if that's the case, all you need to do is keep track of these shadow regions here, the places that are not covered by the sensors, and then try to maintain some kind of bounds, like how many of these agents you want to count could be in these regions. And sometimes as you move around, these things will disappear, or maybe they'll split these white zones, which I call shadows. So it's some kind of combinatorial tracking that's going on without really ever keeping track of precisely where all of the blue dots and red dots and, and green dots are, but just keeping track of how these shadows change. And if they do change, then you better update your count on how many of them are in that region. If they just got merged or if a region disappears and then reappears, then you know there's nobody in that shadow region anymore. So, so things like this can happen. This isn't a fair, I guess if I do this in this room, I can come down here, if I go right here, I can see, okay, there's nobody hiding right there, assuming there's no door. And then I come back like this and I know there's nobody there. So, so keeping track of these kind of minimal pieces of information became very important to us. So we could play hide and seek and kind, kind of games. Um, actually that went all the way back to work that I, that I did with uh, Edith and Rajiv Mokwani way back in the 90s and initial club of tone. And then we had counting problems that were more recent, um, counting how many targets are moving around, let's say. Here's another example. Um, you want a robot that moves around in a planar environment. So this is the robot and made it look curvy here. And then it has a sensor that just reports discontinuities in the distance measurement. So here there's uh, five discontinuities and it only gives you a kind of ordering of them, a cyclic ordering. And you have a motion primitive that says you can move towards one of the discontinuities. Um, again, I don't have a good, maybe there's a discontinuity in that column. So I could chase that column because of the discontinuity. That's the kind of motion primitives you get. So based on that, we showed that we can do distance optimal navigation for a robot. We did it with real robots too. Um, distance optimal navigation by just building some kind of minimal combinatorial structure like this, a little tiny, let's say tree with no metric information, no distances, no angles encoded in it. But as far as the robot's concerned, all of these five environments I'm showing, these five pictures are equivalent. They all have produced the same tree. I'm not gonna show the details of it, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the flavor of it. So coming up with a very small structure and that small structure tells how the geodesics or shortest paths are arranged in the environment. 
from, from some exploration or learning that it did. It went around and explored and it saw how these gaps split or merge, appear and disappear, and then builds this kind of structure. And there's a bunch more we did. So, so a rendezvous without coordinates, can you get a bunch of ships flying around to all find each other by only um, looking out the windshield from one vehicle to another and saying, yeah, I'm gonna keep driving and keeping the other vehicle in my windshield. And then they all kind of come together and we prove with some of the alcohol analysis and a control theory paper about that, uh, kind of bug algorithms and a number of other things. So um, after going down this path of minimalist um, sensor fusion, I got interested in kind of minimal robots and I started getting, this actually, this actually came up a lot with some of the mathematicians I had been working with on this um, big DARPA project. Um, quite a few of them were, um, uh, uh, were educated in Russia. And um, it turns out that students of, of Kolmogorov, um, uh, Sinai is one of them, and then students of Sinai like Bunimovich, um, who's I think at Georgia Tech now. Um, anyway, they, they, um, they started studying these kind of billiard problems as an example of Hamiltonian systems. And it's really fascinating. So there's whole papers on what would happen if I hit a hockey puck here in a kind of stadium, what does the trajectory look like? And um, it turns out there's some fascinating kind of results, which let me see if I have the, yeah, I don't have all of the results here, but basically yeah, I can have a very complicated polygon, as complicated as you want. And for almost all polygons and almost all initial placements of the hockey puck in almost all directions you hit it, the trajectory will be what's called ergodic, which means that it will um, not only cover the space entirely, but um, the, the frequency of visits will be proportional only to the volume of the area you're interested in. So it has a very strong uniform kind of coverage. So it's really fascinating. It doesn't just go in a simple loop um, unless it's some special degenerate case. Obviously I can hit, hit a puck here and it just goes back and forth, but that's unlikely to happen in practice. And these things will break out and go all over the place. I also thought it was kind of interesting to think about bouncing instead of collision avoidance. So I had spent many years thinking about motion planning, which is all about not hitting things. So why not just hit things and see what happens? So we started studying different kinds of bouncing laws. You're coming in at some angle and then you try to bounce off at another angle. It does not have to be the Hamiltonian mechanics kind of model where it's a perfect kind of, let's say reflective bounce, but you can make any kind of robotic bounce you like and then ask questions about what's the smallest kind of sensors I can get away with to do this. Um, and, and what kind of properties do I have? What, what can I cover in the space? Um, <clears throat> And we don't even need this kind of strong ergodicity. We just want something called topological transitivity. I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip the notation, but basically something like there's no interval along the boundary that will not be hit by the trajectory. That's a property I want. So it just goes around banging on all of the walls in smaller and smaller places. So basically, basically that means if there's a little doorway, it's gonna find it and escape. So imagine the robot's a prisoner and it's gonna go bing, 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 and go bouncing around. It's going to find its way out. And these, these um, even these very simple bouncing systems, again, for almost all uh, polygons and almost all initial conditions will, will bounce out. So it seems like motion planning is almost trivial for these kind of things once you allow bouncing off the walls. And you don't have to really bounce off the walls. You can just come really close to the wall, sense it, and then turn and then go away. So you don't really even have to crash. Um, so we started doing crazy things. I got really interested in weasel walls. And let me see if I can get a video going here for that. Have you ever seen a weasel ball toy? It just has a, it just has a small motor in it um, with an with a off-center mass and it oscillates at about two hertz. And I guess I didn't put the sound on this one. And then we just have these simple ramps and we show that we can control the distribution of balls um, in any kind of way that we want by just making these simple ramps. So this is my crowd uh, simulation kind of work. <laughs> Not exactly, but, but um, maybe it looks more like um, uh, gas particles or something and, and trying to violate the second law of thermodynamics. But um, we were able to, to, to very fairly accurately control the distributions of uh, how many balls were in each one of these by the thickness of these gates that are between them and, um, and, then, um, and then also the volumes of the regions. So we did some kind of mathematical analysis, also showed it in practice and um, made a kind of silly minimalist version of multi-robot coordination. So, so that's something we wanted to do. And then we did the same thing with, with simple mobile robots and we made different kinds of gates. We have mechanical gating and, and virtual gates, which is tape and sensors and a large number of things like this where we were exploring, showing that you can take very, very simple, very low cost systems and get the robots to do behaviors that people care about like patrolling environments or getting to the goal or um, um, maybe sweeping the floors eventually and things like that. Um, I started to write a book about this minimalism in, in terms of uh, sensor fusion and then 
minimalist robotics. Um, I wrote one small book around 2012. Then I went on, um, on sabbatical to Northern Finland. Uh, this is Oulu here at 65 degrees North latitude. I went there on a sabbatical, fell in love with the place. But then right as I sat down to start writing this book, um, I got contacted by this kid's uh, company. Uh, this is Palmer Lucky. He was 19 at the time and the company was about two months old, Oculus. And um, they had just gotten a couple of million dollars on their Kickstarter and um, they needed to make things work really fast and were kind of maybe freaking out a bit, I guess. And, um, and uh, the, one of them Googled uh, Euler angles and quaternions and found my, my book online. So, so, I, so I said, yeah, okay, I'll start consulting for you guys. And then eventually became their chief scientist and um, was mainly responsible for head tracking and then a few other things, which I'll talk about. Um, so that was quite a crazy disruption. Maybe it was midlife crisis on my part. I don't really know. So I'm probably one of the last people imaginable that people thought would go to a company. So I did that. Um, so the company was, you know, it was started like in July of 12. And by July of 14, um, well, even by, by March of 14, less than two-year-old company um, was bought for $3 billion by by Facebook. So why did I jump in on that company? Well, as a roboticist, I was accustomed to knowing that robots got better when the components got better. People in the 80s were struggling with sonars. And then in the 90s, these laser scanners came along and everybody's robot papers got better in robotics. And they all felt really smart. They could do really good slam and all kinds of stuff. But so, so I was used to that. And, and, and Palmer Lucky and his friends there, they had this sort of method of making headsets based on smartphone technology, based on the smartphone screens and GPUs. <clears throat> and, and I thought, and, and the IMU sensor. So I thought, hey, that probably is going to work. And it costs, you know, a few hundred dollars instead of uh, tens of thousands of dollars. So, so it was two orders of magnitude cheaper and better quality. That's my wife, Anna, and I. We were working in an apartment kind of secretly in Finland, even with a robot with a sensor on. That's the original uh, DK1 sensor board. And I did a lot of studies with, um, like, uh, temperature sensitivity. The poor guys working in California, the weather is, like, perfect all the time. But I was in uh, Finland in January, so I could put the sensor out the window and then pull it back in again and then carefully measure all the differences for calibration purposes. So stuff like that was really nice. Normally you get a thermal chamber, but we were a very new company. Uh, so I really got into head tracking. And as Julian said, one of the main concerns I had was trying to get latency down. And generally speaking, what you want is spatiotemporal accuracy. Um, latency gets to be a mess because you have prediction and maybe other kinds of things going on like um, post-rendering image warp, which Carmack and friends called time warp, but, but it was around in the 90s in literature, academics going back to the University of North Carolina. And um, I didn't know anything about VR as a researcher. So I just said, well, I'm going to try to do some prediction. And the, the people warned me later, oh, you probably shouldn't have done prediction. It's a double-edged sword. And um, I didn't know that. I just hacked up some stuff one Sunday when I was visiting the company in California from Finland. And um, something's changed. The, the prediction intervals, like the, the latency was really high in 1995, like 80 was considered pretty good, 80 milliseconds. We already had it at 35 in the system we were building. And um, if you're using images, maybe you have one frame of 60 hertz, or, or I'm sorry, 60 frames per second, and then bam, you want to predict into the future really far. I had a thousand hertz gyroscope, and I only needed to predict a little bit into the future. So I had denser data in a shorter amount of time, and I didn't have to predict very far. Well, if you try it naively, like I did, it just works. It's a lot better. They don't want to say it's easy, but, but it was kind of easy. <laughs> um, so then um, I got into that, and I just made some simple method. It just estimates the angular velocity. It was only three degree of freedom tracking, rotation only. So it just estimates the angular velocity, smooths it a bit. If you don't do any prediction, then you've kind of assumed over the 35 milliseconds that the head just immediately stopped. Right? You, have to, you have to make sure you're, you're keeping track of the head so that you can counteract the, 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 the rotations that are, that are occurring. So, so everything has to be kind of perfectly matched. If you don't compensate at all, then it's as if your head just stopped for 35 milliseconds. That can't be right. So doing that worked pretty well. Then I got really kind of smart and spent a couple of weeks working on a method that involves acceleration estimation as well. And um, I did some experiments. This is me turning my head. I don't know what I did here. I can't remember. Maybe I fell asleep. But, but, for, but for the first three, I was just going like this. And, and, and with the original Oculus Rift tracker. And so this is the, the angular error in degrees without um, any prediction. The red one is the one I did in like a few hours of work. And the yellow one was my one that took me a couple of weeks. And it was better in terms of average error and worst case error. So I said, wow, this is great. It's better. I gave it to one of my colleagues, Peter Giocaris, who was kind of 
audio file turned video file. And uh, he said, yeah, it's, wor it's worse. Your new method is worse. And I'm like, it can't be worse. I have plots. I did, I have the data. I, I did science kind of, you know. Um, he said, it's worse. And, and the reason why is that when you hold your head still like this, then you, you can see shaking in the new method. So a little bit of jitter. And um, with the low resolution and the stereo mismatching with like, imagine low resolution with stereo, then, you know, I mean, alias thing we like to call a staircase. Well, I, with, with the Oculus Rift, with your head tracking and problems like that, the, the staircase becomes an escalator because it's like kind of moving. And then with stereo, you have mismatched escalators in front of your face time. So it's kind of like that. And so it's really bad. But it turns out that when you try to predict too much, it's the opposite of smoothing. So smoothing um, tends to increase latency, but it makes the signal smoother. So if you're trying to predict too much, it tends to amplify um, um, uh, the, the kind of jitter, right? So it's anti-smoothing. Um, that's just some stock market data, but you get the idea. The, the, the headset data looked almost identical. So I just, but it's the same, same kind of people who play stock markets know this as well. Um, so one of the things we have, in fact, I think it was the only uh, um, um, idea patent of, of the company at the time, there were some design patents, um, was this kind of perceptually tuned filtering. So the idea is that you have two kinds of modes when you're stationary and then when you turn your head. And when you're stationary, uh, jitter is easily perceived, but not latency. And then when you're moving your head, you perceive latency because if you turn your head and the things are not in the right place at the right time, then you notice. So perceptually tuned, but rather than a common filter or some textbook stuff like that, which is fine, people throw it at everything. Um, this was some perceptually tuned filtering to help make it work a lot better. Um, <clears throat> so eventually I got really into perception, hired a couple of perceptual psychologists. I learned a lot about uh, perceptual psychology and um, we got into all kinds of studies inside the company as quickly as we could. Um, put a lot of like scientific literature into the Oculus Best Practices Guide. Perceptual psychologist I hired named Richard Yao from UIUC mainly did this Best Practices Guide. We also worked with the lawyers on health and safety kinds of things. But um, but but so it was really interesting working with them. They really wanted all of the science and they wanted the most prestigious you know publications that they could find and they want to talk to the experts and things like that. So there's all these factors coming in and if you don't get it right, you have disbelief, fatigue, sickness. And it's very hard to measure across people. Well, I'm still not zipping as fast as I thought. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, good. So still doing okay. Um, so then um, I think they said 2014 was the VR consumer revolution. Then I updated this slide to say 15, and then I put 16, and then um, and then I stopped updating the slide. I don't know, but, but um, so when is the big revolution coming? Um, whenever the killer app comes, I guess, right? So, so one of those kind of things. Then the company started saying, oh, it's AR because of Pokemon Go. <laughs> but I'm like, AR, wait a minute, you're not wearing the, the, the phone. I think it was more like a geolocation phenomenon or maybe a Pokemon phenomenon because it wasn't reproduced. But everybody said, no, it's AR. And the thing I noticed in big companies was that um, when everyone's competing for resources, the graphics people tended to push for VR and the computer vision people tended to push for AR. So because each one wants their stuff to, to save the day kind of and they get the resources. So that, that's loosely speaking, that's kind of how it tended to look in industry. So, um, so, so vision people were getting very excited about these things. And um, eventually you do get back to the glasses again, but it was like a, a pathway. Um, and then the, the words just get kind of more and more blurred, virtual reality, augmented reality. And I don't know what's going on. This is still some older slides a little bit, but, but it's just kind of getting all merged together. People start using XR for a while. I thought VR was fine in the first place. It, it goes back to a manual count and it, it's, it's fine, you know, it's, it's kind of, but, but um, whatever. Um, and then what you start to do when you realize there's gonna be no devices is you, you, you build a metaverse for it anyway, right? So that's kind of what happened back with um, Second Life. But the creators of Second Life actually wanted VR to be working by then. And they did everything else but that, right? The, 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 other than the headset. So now it's like, yeah, let's go back and build the 3D worlds again. I mean, there is really good progress on the headsets and some things coming. I'll, I can say a little bit about that. But the problem in industry largely is recycling. Everyone's building on the things they already have and trying to move very quickly, right? Move quickly and break stuff. I don't remember if they still say that anymore at Facebook, but they're moving very fast. So everyone's moving quickly. But for example, uh, virtual reality, like using Unity um, to do virtual reality, very, very popular. We worked directly with Unity but, um, on the source code and stuff back at the back in the day when I was at Oculus. And um, it felt like all of your VR experiences are going to look like a first person shooter game unless you fight really hard against that. Right? So, so all of the tools are trying to get you to flow a certain way. 
It's gotten better, but that's what happens when you recycle. Everything's doing it. The sensors were designed for something else. The displays were designed for something else. Um, the software stack is designed for something else. The operating system was not designed for this. So there's a lot of interesting research that can be done in universities and in companies, but the companies want to move sort of very, very fast. And this kind of recycling ends up being a problem. So I got really interested in virtual reality for, for other organisms and just in general, sort of asking more basic scientific questions about it. I couldn't believe that there's lab. Do you know this? There's, there's labs where they, they have like uh, rodents run on big balls and even little fruit flies run on little tiny balls. And they, they have electrodes in their heads and they, and they, they measure um, whether or not they, they, they give them, this is their virtual reality. It's a cave system for them. So, and um, um, anyway, they, they can actually, you know, do some things legally to them so that they can study whether or not they're getting, gaining place cells and grid cells when they do these kinds of things. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, I got really into human physiology and perception. And of course, you know, you wonder about these things that are going on. Um, I don't have to tell people here that, you know, there's more to, to, to inferring depth than simply stereopsis, right? I, I can see a lot of, I know these aren't little tiny people elevated up really high. I believe they're kind of in the background far away, right? Even though it's just a painting. So, so there's a lot of extra cues that are going to work. And people who are naive in the subject may think it's just stereopsis that's doing everything. And there's all this kind of weird stuff. Does anybody see that as a perfect grid with all straight lines? You do? I want to meet somebody who does it because then your eyes are broken in some kind of strange way. Um, or that one, if it's big enough, it starts getting wavy. The people in the front row probably can get almost nauseated by it. So even a stationary image is really strange. In the back, it probably doesn't look wavy, but all kinds of weird stuff. Um, we had problems with um, people adapting to the content they're making. So human subjects are a lot of trouble. And um, um, what we needed to do was perceptually train them to notice the flaws, not just adapt until the flaws don't bother them anymore. So you have to get them to like, it's like forced adaptation of some kind. So like myself, when I started at Oculus, I could only detect the latency down to about 40 milliseconds. When I stopped at Oculus, I could detect it down to about two milliseconds. And it's because I would, I would train myself to go like this. I have like a two hertz oscillation and I would look for a phase shift basically. And so, so I would just, and I would train other people to do that. And I could tell them after a while, like, yeah, this one, this one's getting the left frame is, is, is eight milliseconds behind the, the right frame, fix it. And they're like, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah, I think it is. You know, go like this next. And then, <laughs> then you see like things, like, you know, things like that. It's really weird. So, um, so there's all kinds of problems like that. Um, headsets, I don't know if I want to say too much other than it was kind of funny that a lot of the industry leaders were saying our headset is so good that we've beaten the sickness problem. And I would tend to say it's so good that you can make people more sick than ever before. <laughs> um, usually that's because of vection, the illusion of self motion, which is that um, if you're sitting down in a chair and moving around, Valve was much more clever about this. They made room size VR, which Oculus did not want to do because they wanted this system for everybody. So you just sit in a chair, sit in your home gaming environment, sit at a desk and use VR. Not many people have a whole living room that they can devote to VR. But then everyone thought Valve's headset was so much more comfortable. But that's because largely because their, their content involved you just walking around in the environment, not grabbing a joystick and dragging yourself around. So when you start doing that, then this part of your body gets upset, or at least it gets the wrong signals in comparison to the visual part of your body. So that mismatch um, you know, causes trouble. And guess what? The higher the resolution, higher the contrast, brightness, field of view, all of those things that you try to strive for just make you more and more sick. So, so don't do that. Okay, fine. But people still want to do locomotion and that's an interesting area of research. Um, this is kind of funny to me in, 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 vi in um, vision science. So, so perceptual psychology, the branch called vision science, um, perception of motion is a big part of it. And you can imagine humans are very good at perceiving motion. Why? Well, maybe uh, historically, or let's say prehistorically, um, you might be, you might notice lunch going by, right? Or you might be lunch, right? So, so, so you need to jump out of the way perhaps. So, so, uh, so motion detection is very, very important for, for, for humans and other biological organisms. It's reversed for, for VR headsets. Perception of stationarity is the hard part. If I start moving around like this or turning my head, some things that are supposed to be stationary need to be perceived as stationary. And all of the flaws of the system, frame rates and tracking errors and all kinds of spatial temporal nonsense and aliasing and everything else is causing perception of non-stationarity. It's trying to trigger motion perception. So that's a very bad problem. So just making stuff look stationary is really the hard part. 
Now, how much pixel density is enough? You may notice that the displays keep getting better and better. I don't know if you know, but the, they kind of generally say 60 pixels per degree. That, that goes back to Steve Jobs saying that when you hold a, the iPhone up um, and, and read it at kind of a normal distance, you cannot see pixels anymore. It's also based on um, optometry. It also depends on contrast and brightness and things like that. So it's not really a hard fixed number. It's more complicated than that. But that's kind of what people are shooting for. There's a company in Finland called Vario, V-A-R-J-O. Um, they make a really nice headset that at least in some part of the field of view is this resolution. And they've blended it with an outer part that's really hard to tell where the blending is. Um, that's great, but there's more problems. Basically, the, the trouble comes about because you're still putting a smartphone screen in front of your face. And this wasn't made for sitting in front of your face, right? So it's optimized for something else, especially not you know, turning your head and having the, you know, the images need to move back and forth perfectly to have correct perception of stationarity. So all of this stuff is coming together to haunt us. That's why we ended up with a kind of display plateau where you know, Oculus and, and subsequent people all coming into the market brought everything to the next level using those components, the smartphone ones, but what now? Now you gotta get even better, right? How do you get better? -er? Better, -er. I think we can say that, right? Um, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a challenge because it involves redoing the fundamentals. Optical science and engineering is one of the hottest areas right now in this field because those are, you know, you can't just program your way out of it Silicon Valley style. Silicon Valley is mostly a bunch of programmers, right? Even though it's not named that way. But um, you can't just program your way out of this mess, right? This is like hardcore physics. Um, just like, it's like a semiconductor device theory, but it's optical device theory and it's a very similar kind of thing. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Oh, I mentioned Vario Okay, It's one of their older headsets. Foveated rendering is helping. We all know about that from NVIDIA and many other companies. Um, there's a lot of progress in waveguides. They're getting a lot lighter, a lot higher field of view, low cost, accuracy, color, balance, all kinds of really good things going on in that space. But I can't really talk about it too much. It's not these that I'm showing you. These are just public things. But I just want to say that um, um, you, you can expect, oh, where's the right picture? Have to oh, yeah, this one. This is a very nice kind of technology where you have, say, I don't know if you know about this. It was, um, has a, um, a laser. You can shine lasers in your eyes now, but only certain lasers that are very low power and, and very tiny dot. And then you're essentially draw, and, and if you combine that with MEMS micro mirrors, then you, um, then you can draw on your retina just as if your retina was a CRT monitor, like an old style CRT monitor. And then all of the things you learn about lenses and optics mean nothing anymore. Because you're just drawing on the retina directly. You're not gathering light from a bunch of different directions and focusing it. So this stuff really works. I would have guessed that this would not work, but I've seen it in my eyes. Wait, wait a minute. I no, no I, I, yeah, I, I did not burn my retina out. And, I, it's, um, and I, I've seen it and, and it's, it's really wonderful. Um, so these things can happen. Some companies may or may not be doing it any day now. I can't really say. Some of them maybe you know, <laughs> to the west of here somewhere, but um, anyway, it's okay. Um, so along the quest for quality, I think I'm okay. Um, we have, um, I live in Finland, so everyone, it's a very Nokia oriented culture. So people like to think about quality of service of telecommunications. And then of course there's quality of experience. So what's the quality of XR going to be? And I, I just finished leading a big project across Finland anyway, that involved a lot of big companies, including Huawei and others and, uh, and Barrio and, and, and um, and um, we, we tried to get at some kind of foundations of what this might mean. Um, many, many factors. I already had a version of the slide, but I'm just throwing more factors on there now. And um, I started thinking about things. And how do we observe what's going on in these systems? Well, we can measure devices, optimal systems, metrology, I don't know, audio capture, IMUs, camera. You can do a lot of things. There's some robots we have in the lab that big companies use to just, they just, it's like a, it's like a robot head that you can put a headset on and instead of eyes, it has cameras. And then it just turns its head around and experiences VR, but takes measurements. So, so there's a specialized system for that. Then there's um, you know, dealing with the annoying humans that tend to screw up all of your studies. Um, and so there's questionnaires or you can stick things on them that measure you know, what's going on inside their bodies, but then they get, up, they get irritated by that. And then they, they give you know, all kinds of stuff happens. They sweat too much or who knows, all kinds of things. So, 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 so dealing with the humans, is there as well. But the thing I was really curious about is what are the um, theoretical models underlying these things? It's very difficult because the human body is mostly a kind of black box. And so I started thinking about things going back to Oculus and we live in engineering land slash computer science where we have these things we can do 
graphics is one of them. See, optical engineering, computer vision, sensor fusion, MEMS, all these kind of things, electronics. So we build stuff and program stuff. Meanwhile, the other half of the system still gets kind of neglected or as an afterthought, like, oh, we made this really cool thing. Get some human subjects to say that it's good. You know, like, oh, I don't know. So, but, but um, this is the hardware. There's human physiology and neuroscience and then vision science. And then there's kind of, I don't know if that's the software part, but anyway, there's, there's a perceptual psychology going on. This is reverse engineering, right? It was built by some aliens. Who knows how it's how we got built? It doesn't matter really what your beliefs are, but but um, what do you do in these fields? You poke and prod and hopefully don't disturb the system too much and try to get good measurements. So I believe that, that there's a field emerging of perception engineering, just like these sciences of physics, chemistry, biology um, and went in that they, they, they kind of let's say migrated by applying their principles into engineering fields. I believe by applying the scientific principles that have been learned over here in the red box, um, there's, this, there's this field of um, perception engineering emerging. So the idea is to create, let's say, design and deliver perceptual illusions. So it's the, it's, it's the field of creating perceptual illusions. Where do those live? Well, they tend to live in the organism, but there's a bunch of engineering stuff that's causing that to happen too. Right? Um, and yeah, it's related to HCI and HRI and BMI and computer graphics and a lot of other things, of course. So, so but. Um, that's the idea. So I'm very happy that we were able to win a, um, an advanced research ERC grant, advanced grant from Brussels. So we're in the second year of that now. So we have four years remaining. And um, it's really looking at these kind of mathematical foundations of what perception engineering would be. And one of the main things I wanted to do based on my own background is to span both engineered systems and organisms. So, so both living and sort of things we built. The reason why is because if we built it ourselves, it's not a black box. It should not be. We know how it works. So, um, so, so therefore, we can understand a lot. And then by trying to build a theory for both, we can ask ourselves, why does it make sense for engineered things, but not for biological things or vice versa? So it helps to bring a lot of these things together. So my grand sort of theory, I want to have some big sort of, let's say, general theory of VR. Part of it would specialize to robots, and part of it would specialize to um, organisms. And then there's a more specific kind of thing as you go down because one grand theory can't sort of account for everything. But I at least want to find some kind of similarities at the top. And then in our research, we do a lot of actual work with um, experiments with human subjects and simulation and lots of other things as well. Um, so here's an example. A couple of years ago, we wrote a paper um, called VR for Robots. So what would it mean for a robot to experience VR? Well, we, we, we defined all the formal mappings. You know that in, in, in VR, um, the display is an important part, right? So, um, and, and if, you have, if you're wearing earphones, that's also an acoustic display, right? Or an audio display. So um, we got this, um, we, we developed a kind of general theory and then we just kind of in a playful way decided to do VR for this vacuum cleaning robot. So what we wanted to do is fool the robot into thinking it was in this tiny room like this instead of this big room like this. And Marku Swomalina, one of the co-authors and postdoc in my group, I asked him to be the display. Um, so he's, a, he's the display. He goes around with a big piece of cardboard and he tries to trick the robot into thinking there's a wall there. And by the time it's done, um, that's a VR system. And the robot reports, here's the map, and it has no idea that it's been messed with. And we have some math that kind of says, you know, this is what happened, this is what, how we decided to do it, and it's all fun. And we can say exactly, okay, Actually, this robot's a black box because this is not our robot. We just bought it. But if we take one of our robots in our lab, we can open it up and it will report exactly what it believes. And, and, and so we, we can't do that for the human. You can do it for the rodent. You can measure these uh, place cells and grid cells a little bit, but it's really hard. And the, the, the system's not engineered by us. So this is what we get. And, and in, a v, in a robotic system, you can even do 100% pure VR. You can fool every single sensor system in the robot. But for a human, it's kind of hard to do that, right? You have proprioception. You remember where your body is, whether you think about it or not. Are you sitting or standing, for example, or vestibular organ? Has anyone ever had vestibular stimulation? No, it's terrible, so don't do it. It hurts <laughs> like hell, but, but, but I did it once on a stage. I don't know why, I, 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 I think that was at Huawei actually, that was interesting. But, but um, it was some researchers from Osaka University. They put some headset on me and they made me like start walking along curves, like as if I were intoxicated. But it hurt like hell, so I don't recommend it. But um, anyway, so you can't overcome all of your senses. We cannot think of any way to put your brain in a vat, so to speak. So, um, but for a robot, you can put its brain in a vat and make it think whatever. So that's pretty nice. 
Um, so how do you create perceptual illusions? There's a little bit of an inkling of like the kind of theory we're starting to develop. So um, have you seen the Ames room illusion? This is really amazing. So it's a nice thing to look for. Uh, this, this lady here is, is not really small compared to this guy here. They're just in some odd shaped room where even the tile floor is not really, these aren't really square tiles. It's all been stretched out in reality. And you have to look through a people. Why do you look through a people? That's to kill your stereo vision. Because otherwise, if you, if you had uh, virgins, then you, would, then you would notice a lot more of being tricked. So you have to look through a people. And then um, all of the cues in this room are designed to, to, to confuse you so that the only thing left is that, oh, yeah, this, this person must be small and this one must be enormous. Right? But everything's been designed to fool you because you can move a person back and forth along this ray and there's no way they can tell. The only explanation left is that they change scale. Really? So, um, so why not do something like this? Let's think about the projection ray model. This is a, like a one-dimensional um, camera image. I'm going to have a, 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 um, a projection ray here, and I can move this object back and forth. I'm going to call that a pre-image. I'm going to talk about pre-images for any kind of sensor that we have, a kind of theory of pre-images. So let's just say in general, I have some kind of state space, some big configuration space. I've talked about these kind of spaces. I talked about all of your configurations in the room and maybe some big space. We define the space. We don't have to store it on a hard drive or on a cloud. We just define it. That's all. So we just have a big space. And then we have this thing called the observation space, which is what can the sensor output? And then we have a sensor mapping that just goes from you know, whatever the state is to whatever gets observed. And then the most interesting thing is the pre-image. This looks like an inverse, but it's for a function that's not invertible. So this comes up in mathematics a lot in real analysis, for example, um, Lebesgue measure theory or whatever. The Lebesgue integral needs these, for example. Most people don't play with Lebesgue integrals for fun, probably. Um, but anyways, um, so, so, so the idea is um, this is the set of all X's that could have given you that Y. So for example, let's think about it in the room here. Suppose this is just a planar room. Let's get all the people out in furniture and just make it a simple planar room. And I'm a robot. I just have X, Y, and theta. And then I get a single measurement and it goes uh, bing, uh, four meters. Where could I be? Well, I could be like this, right? But I could also be like this maybe. Right, so, so there's a two-dimensional set of possibilities. That's the pre-image. Um, so the, the, the pre-images are actually a partition of the state space. It's like a running the state space through a bread slicer, I like to say. And that's the resolution at which the world can kind of be perceived by that single sensor reading. And then I started thinking about things like triangulation. Um, the only thing I can read on this is um, the geometry. So, which makes good sense to me. The Chinese I can't read, but but um, or is that really old Chinese? Maybe so. Even Chinese people can't read it. Maybe okay. Some Taiwanese people can read it. Maybe I don't know. I can read you it. can read it. Good. What does it say? It just say it's a, a picture of watching birds. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought it said. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Anyway, this part's interesting, right? So, um, so what is triangulation? By the way, triangulation for people who work with meshes and computational geometry means one thing. This is triangulation from sensor theory. Let's say, right, which basically means um, take these pre images. This is the map that, that how I would define it, how I have defined it. Take these pre images and intersect them. I get multiple measurements. I just intersect the pre images to make a consistent picture. So here, the triple intersection for three measurements would be the, the result. So, for example, if I have two cameras and each one of the pre images is the green ray there, maybe only coming after the pinhole, to be fair. And this is how stereo vision works, right? This intersecting two rays. So that's exactly this principle applied to two. Um, this is the ancient triangulation that the Chinese picture was supposed to be showing. It's looking at the angle between two landmarks. And then if, if you have a fixed angle, then you can be anywhere along a circle. And if you don't know which landmarks to the left or right, you can be along the other circle. And then you just intersect those circles. So people figured this out a long time ago. So people have been before they got all confused about stochastic things and Gaussian things or whatever they're doing, um, it's just, it's here in the geometry and it's very simple and elegant. Um, Triliteration, very useful. I'm gonna have an example. So this one's important to pay attention to it. Um, there's, a, there's some towers and you know their coordinates are in the plane, two dimensional. And uh, we have sensors that just tell how far away each tower is. So if that's the case, then um, if you just have a sensor that tells how far away the tower is, you could be anywhere in a circle. In three dimensions, it's a sphere. GPS works like this, but it brings four dimensions because it brings in time. So, so there's a lot of stuff going on there, but, but it's okay. And then um, 
after three of these, after two of them, you could be in any one of two points. After two observations, after three, the triple intersection gives you a, a unique point. Um, right. Well, now let's do perception engineering for this trial iteration system. So let's suppose I'm going to start messing around with um, tower number two. And um, we're going to change. Well, first of all, how does a sensor work? I didn't. I did not really define it, and I'm not going to do it in this talk. Let me just give you a little bit of an idea. Um, the, the poor robot, or maybe the foolish human who's using the sensor, is out in the field somewhere using it and just looking at the measurements. Okay, and then some gods, who are the more clever engineers that are going to do a prank or something, know how the the, the sensor works, and it knows that it's based on calibration of the power level coming from the tower. So power levels decay what the quadratically with distance so you know it's calibrated to give good answers then what they do is they start changing the power of station two if they crank up the power then um then the, the sensor or whoever's holding the sensor robot or human will believe that the tower is closer if you turn the power down you'll believe you're further away from it so you can interfere with this now um in this particular setting how many how many choices do you have well if there's only one tower so if you go back to like this case of um just a single tower. If all I have is one tower, then if I if I change this power, you can convince the sensor it's almost anywhere, right? You can get really close, or you can make it seem it's really far. It's unbounded. You have a lot of luxury or liberty. If you have two towers, then there's a limited range. You can only let's say it's let's say it's this green, the red green, the red circle, and the green circle. Then you have to make the red circle somewhere between here and here, so it has to go between these, and that's all. So you get a, a, an interval. But that's all. If you have three towers, then you'd better get it right. You either have, you only have one ghost point. You have one real point. I don't remember which one's which anymore, but you have one ghost point and one real point. And that's it. So in the case of um, in the case of three, it's very brittle. So sometimes you have what's like a robust illusion. You can make an illusion that's eh, kind of sloppy and it's going to be fine. It's a very robust illusion. The particular parameters don't matter. Reminds me of a persistent homology or something, if you know about those things in, in topological data analysis. A very nice kind of property, but then um, it, it, in this case with three towers, it's very brittle. And, and guess what? If you if you mess up, then this triple intersection becomes empty, and that makes an implausible world. And that's kind of like bad VR, right? So something. Wait a minute, that can't happen, and then things get messed up. All right. So then we start thinking about fooling agents. Um, I'm going to go a little bit fast so I can make sure I get some questions. I think. Um, so we start thinking about going from perception to interaction. So these robots or agents can interact, not just, you know, not just infer from one sensor reading. So we have interaction. In that case, we have a dynamical system. There's an internal brain, like of the robot or agent or human or whatever it is. And then there's an external physical world, which we've talked about. And then the internal states get converted by some strategy into action. So there's actuation going on. And then the states get measured by some sensor H. I already gave you that. That then go feed into the brain. So it's a kind of coupling of dynamical systems. This looks a lot like game theory. And uh, it's going to be in a bit. I'll return back to these information spaces. So now to create a VR experience, we just rip off this part and put this here, which has a stimulator, an actuator, and then some kind of virtual world generator with a bunch of pretty graphics or whatever needs to have happen here. And um, this is where it starts to get interesting between the agent's viewpoint and the god's viewpoint. Because um, isn't all of this in the physical world too? It's just that it involves some state variable that only the gods know about. It's like the gods knew maybe that the, that the distance sensor was based on power measurements. So the gods here know enough to make all of this stuff to fool the agent. And of course, a human remembers they put on a VR headset, but thanks to the power of attention, they tend to forget for a while. You know, or they, so, so it's, it's really interesting. But that's, robots tend not to forget unless you do a memory wipe. But, uh, but that, that's a little different. But, uh, but anyways, that's how it comes together. Um, we, we spend a lot of time studying neuroscience and um, free energy principle and uh, predictive coding and other things are very close. This is one from one of Friston's papers in uh, neuroscience. And it's the same kind of picture. It's just very heavy on information theory, not uh, uh, information spaces. But, but, uh, but it's all kind of presumed stochastic kinds of things, which I'm ambivalent about. You can throw stochastic in or take it out. I don't really care um, for robots. I don't want to force them to be stochastic, that's for sure. Um, so all of this stuff relates back to information spaces and game theory, playing games like Battleship or Blind Chess. Or, you know, these are kind of old things that, they, that this theory came out of. Um, it shows up a lot in control theory. Oh, 
You may have seen POMDPs, partially observable Markov decision processes in AI. That's versions of this, but that one's purely Bayesian. There's non-Bayesian versions, combinatorial versions, all kinds of these. The, the basic information state is what's the history of all of the actions that I've given as commands from the brain's perspective, and what are all the sensor observations that came in? That's called the history information state. It's a very big thing to make a decision based off of if you've been running around for a long time. And so what we want to do, this is the space of all histories. And we just keep adding more and more things to them. I get new actions, new sensor observations. So what we want to do is map them all down to something smaller, make these derived information spaces. And eventually try to get down to something minimalist and just keep working with that. So that as you get new data, you just live in some much smaller space and you don't have to go up to some big space. In other words, maybe I just take the average of my measurements and that's enough or the average of the last 10 measurements. Maybe that's enough. Usually not, probably something more clever, but that's the idea. Some statistics. Are they sufficient statistics? Not necessarily in the typical Bayesian parameter estimation sense, but they're sufficient for solving some kinds of tasks. We have a brand new paper on this at the conference called Wafer this year that um, shows that these minimal ones always exist and are unique in a very, very general setting up to like Polish spaces and other weird things like that. Um, so, so generally speaking, there's a kind of theory of making these derived spaces, which I'm not going to talk about, but just give you the general idea. And remember the slice of bread thing? Well, it turns out all of your, your different ways of slicing the bread fit into something called a partition lattice, and it covers the resolution at which the world can be observed or, or, or dealt with in some way. There's a state space level and state time space and trajectory space version. But in any case, we're working hard on understanding these things um, at a mathematics level, a pure mathematics level. And uh, then I want to understand VR in terms of these information spaces so that uh, in a passive way, you just alter the trajectory so that this, the information states inside the robot's head, or, or if it were a human, then the human's head, but it's not going to be like that, then it remains unaltered. Or you make it active and that you force a new information trajectory, but the agent maybe believes that it's plausible. It's a different one than what would have happened, but it needs to be believable. And you could have even errors and intervals that sort of say, how much, how long has it been different for and by how much? And uh, that starts to look like a measure of fatigue, forced fusion in a lot of uh, Marty Banks' papers from Berkeley is one of the terms that came up, was, was a term used to explain uh, VR fatigue, forced fusion. How hard is your vision system working to overcome all the flaws? These are these kind of like empty intersections that, that happened in the, in the triangulation case. Um, let's see here, make sure I get a little bit of these hard digits. Yeah, thank you, that's about right. So, um, so we have one fundamental thing, as I've said, is for the, for the robots, it's a white box for the most part, unless you stole somebody else's robot or you know, corporate robot, like my purchased vacuum cleaner. For the humans and other organisms, it's a black box, especially for humans, we don't really want to break them apart too much. So, um, so that's kind of a problem. And um, I, I think that that's how all this fits together nicely. I want to understand a lot about the white box system so that we can leverage that for understanding the black box system. We do a lot of work in our group on telepresence as one of the things. I'm just finishing up now some, some things here. Uh, we look at robots with panoramic cameras and a VR headset for the human so that you can feel like you're tele-embodied. Um, and then there's all kinds of interesting problems. It relates to locomotion for VR, but um, we have um, different kinds of filtering. Like if the robot moves along and rotates, you can unrotate the rotation because you have a panoramic camera. Just like this thing is cleverly zooming around, it just takes in everything and then zooms the right way. Well, you can also unrotate the picture. So why not do that? We showed with human subjects that that's a good idea. So we just uh, undo the rotations. We also can do motion planning and bring that into the problem, right? So that's the basic idea. And then there's these, uh, the general conclusions. I, I believe there's this emerging discipline called perception engineering. We're trying to build a general mathematical model of VR thanks to the ERC especially. And um, you know, robots can be 100% virtual. We want to close this gap between the robot and human in understanding these things, and um, and then compare specific cases across robots and organisms. Hopefully, it helps guide us on where to look, predict outcomes, provide explanations, do analysis. And now, just when you think it's done, oh, my book. Oops, uh, that's a new book on VR. It's supposed to come out any day, but uh, it's been any day for a while. Um, I, I can tell you stories if you want, um, but really, it's any day. This is a book. I don't know if you've seen this one. This is about a. This is like a popular press book about VR and, and Oculus. So you can look for that if you want. Um, a lot of interesting things are told in there. Um, and now I have bonus material. Um, I haven't worked on RRTs in, for about 20 years and all of a sudden I just did again. 
um, mainly because my son Alexander is 21 talked me into it because he thinks motion planning is really cool and I told him it's kind of boring but but um, but then I remembered that I loved it and we had a lot of fun together so we went back and started working on RRTs for the kinodynamic planning problem where you want to plan a path from point A to point B but there's dynamics and we did a we call it bang bang boosting where you have a um, what's called a double integrator so you just have double integrator dynamics so you have acceleration you just accept the acceleration and you have acceleration bounds for each one of the coordinates so i so for each one of the coordinates in your configuration space i have position and velocity and then i can set the acceleration this is time optimal control theory goes back to pontryagin it's known that if you want to go from some initial to some goal in the phase space I referred to Donkey Kong on my first slide. Did anyone ever get to the Pi factories on Donkey Kong? Does anybody know that? That, that reference is going to really fall flat. Well, anyway, <laughs> if, 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 if you're up if you're up here, then all of the flow is this way because this is the velocity axis and then this is the position axis. And if you're down here, you have to flow this way. And the lower you are, the faster you flow, and the higher you are, the faster you flow. So it's like a flowing thing. So you're like on conveyor belts. Anyways, if you want to go from here to here. The best way to do it in terms of time is to go here and then switch. So you just have to calculate switch points along intersecting parabolas. So it's been worked out before, but we worked it out again. And then we have this weird problem of coordinating a bunch of double integrators, one for each dimension or each degree of freedom of our system. And we found out that this is the fastest way to go like this, go up to a faster conveyor belt and then down. And, but then sometimes you need to slow down to wait for the other double integrator to get there. And that ends up being really challenging you can go as slow as this one if you want, this curve here. But then if you want to go a little bit slower, um, like if you're down here, you won't be able to get back up and catch this guy anymore. You're going to have to go all the way down and flow this way and come back. But the way to do that optimally is just do this. So this extra time that it takes ends up being a nuisance. And you have to solve that somehow. So we have some efficient solution for doing that. And then we made a bang, bang boosted RRT that uses this time optimal metric. And the old RRT from our old paper from 20 years ago Maybe it looks something like this for a four-dimensional problem. It's a two-dimensional vehicle with accelerations in X and Y direction. This is a 2D projection of it. The tree looks like this, and then the new tree looks like this. And then you can run it a bunch of times. This is a typical run. So I mean, if we think it does much more, much better exploration. Remember, this is a, a projection of a four-dimensional space. Um, the, the new one is about 1,500 times faster for that example. And uh, there's some other examples. Oh, this is how the, the, the 2D one that James Kuffner and I did um, after the, um, the, the original sort of RRT with differential constraints. It's even faster, but it, because it's only 2D. So, so it's still faster, but it's not too much longer really to handle the full dynamics, which I think is, is nice. We also use it as a bang bang optimization method to do path smoothing and, and shortening. So we can very quickly um, optimize paths as well. Um, here's a couple more examples. So in, in green is the, is the path that we computed. And then uh, the purple is the optimized trajectory. I really like this swirly one here. So that's, a, again, a time optimal trajectory, at least within under some conditions. Um, I'll just say it's a very fast trajectory anyway. So. And then um, we also have a manipulator example. And I'll show one, to finish my talk, I'll show an animation because you have to have an animation. Otherwise, exactly. So, um, so I have a very simple animation of that. It just kind of get, gives you an idea of, of trying to make this thing go really fast and go through obstacles. We just submitted, we're submitting this to the ICRA conference this week. So, so I'll have a, uh, let me see if I can get that. So we'll do this and then I gotta find my pointer here. Okay, I think I can still find here. Let's see if this guy comes through here. There we go. I'm really old school Linux. <laughs> we used to type back in my day. Oh, and it's on the other screen. Okay, no. Yeah, it's playing, but somewhere else. Come on. My pointer. I'll put it again. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to move it. To you. I'm trying to do it. It's, yeah, I just, yeah, exactly. You found the mouse? <laughs> Where's the mouse? There's the mouse. Oh, there's the mouse. Come back, mouse. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There we go. Thought I had it right away. That's the video that should be playing. Yeah, we play it again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a twenty-dimensional robot that um, that it has a forty-dimensional state space that's been time optimized. So you can see it kind of slides everything around about as fast as you can go through there. So it has double integrated greater dynamics for twenty times over, and um, I think that optimization took like a second on in a Python implementation on a standard PC or something. So 
it's, it's, it's fun to play with. So, so there's the requisite animation. Thank you. We have a bit of time for questions. Waiting for questions. I have to say that uh, in robotics conference, there were less and less sessions dedicated to motion planning, but it, it looks like we found a way to uh, have them back. <laughs> so it, at some point, we were wondering. Nostalgia. The, the motion planning frame was so long. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for the excellent talk. Um, with respect to this discipline of perception engineering, yeah. you were advocating and what you're building up. So, what is the role from your personal perspective of machine learning methods in that field? And what is the role of classical methods? Um, well, I think that one of the things that this theory gives when we talked about these minimal information spaces. I think those would be like the idealized thing that could possibly be learned. Like what is the absolute minimum you can get away with? That's independent of any architectures or parameters, hyperparameters, any of that stuff. What, what is it really the, the minimal thing you can get away with in terms of an information transition system, we call it. So I think that's one kind of thing that's helpful. Um, it, aside from that, um, our, our quest is really to understand, to build models that we can reason about and do analysis with. So I would like to have things that look like, you know, force equals mass times acceleration rather than like, we could learn that, but if we have it, then we can go even further with it, right? Because it helps us to do proofs and analysis and things like that. Thank you very much for the talk. Now, um, you, you mentioned, uh, say, uh, in, in, in the VR research, you now have, uh, have computer research people, computer graphics people, HCI, maybe psychologies and robotics. Yeah. So, I mean, traditionally, these people don't work together. Now, XR or VR probably give them an opportunity. So, do you see any challenges in the future that will motivate these people to solve together? Like, if I write a funding proposal, what would be a good idea for doing so? Yeah, that, that's a very difficult problem. I guess that has to do with human beings and hmm. how they tend to work. And most people are very constrained, right? So, it, yeah. sh should, a, uh, should a PhD student take that on and then Maybe they don't get a faculty position or an industry position because they didn't work on the right thing. I, it, it's really hard to say. I just feel like this is what should happen. It may take 10 or 20 or 50 years. Um, and that's sort of fine. That's the kind of thing we should be thinking about in universities. The companies can, you know, they, they, they sink or swim kind of in shorter time frames. So um, especially when the, the economy gets tighter, that's, we'll see what happens in the next year or two. But, but, um, but in the universities, at least, I think we, we can look at these things that are long ways off. But unfortunately in universities, traditional academic departments die hard, right? And, and those are the ones that give tenure to people. So, so that's also very tough. I don't know what to say about it. It's just one of these. Roboticists face the same problem. Like robotics is very often not looked at as a serious discipline um, because everyone thinks it's an application. Oh, it's an application of control theory. It's an application of, now it's called an application of machine learning, whatever. But, but, um, but it's, it's actually a field that has very deep fundamental questions. And I believe VR is the same way. It's also not taken seriously in the same kind of way. It's not just business and technology and headsets and stuff like that. There's really deep fundamental questions here. So another thing I hope to convince people of with this kind of emerging discipline and the kind of mathematical theory behind it is that this is a serious, like worthy of its own study discipline, not just some technology tricks or hacks or somebody's application of graphics or application of HCA or application of computer vision, application of deep learning or whatever it is. It's, it's something else. It has its own basic fundamental question. I agree. Hi, thank you for a very presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm actually so about mathematical engineering uh, uh, video analysis. And I know more and more people are doing this machine treatment for training based on the output. So, other AR device. But sometimes I'm curious that uh, if, uh, if uh, a clinician or a clinical trainer who is not very familiar with the AR device, so if they, they are, uh, if they are, if they, if they are, uh, uh, you say clinical trainer? Or? Yeah, clinical trainer or clinician. And, uh, and do you do you do you think some research on that we could assess well the human behavior be affected by the AI device? Uh, oh, I see what you mean. So, so maybe there's there's two things maybe that you're saying. One one of them is that a person who uses the devices yeah. probably needs training to use them correctly. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing. The other thing is long-term after effects. That's one of the things we talked about with the lawyers 
a long time ago, right? Because <laughs> you can't have everyone kind of, well, I think most of our lives are ruined by these things anyway, we can all agree, but, but um, so, so there, there are these kind of long-term consequences. If you start adapt, so one thing that's, that's different between the robot and the humans is that the biological organisms have adaptation yeah. at all levels, like adjusting to light levels and sound levels and all these things are happening all the time. And so if you adapt too much to VR and you're not experiencing the real world often enough, um, it could lead to lots of problems, even just depression. Like maybe in VR, you're, you're accustomed to having long rubbery arms that can grab objects from far away and <laughs> hang out with your friends wherever you feel like you're there. Then you get depressed because you can't do that in the real world. All, all kinds of things could happen. It's, it's very, it's very hard, hard to say, right? So, um, so there's these kinds of difficulties, but um, those, those all remain to be studied. Um, Maybe I have one question. So we, the senior and the yours, we have a paper at Atrophy VR, which is VR for robots. But we- uh, And I think I cited it in our VR for robots paper. I think, I hope so. <laughs> I think we met online at some point and we- Yeah, 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 okay, but, okay, uh, okay. Sorry if I missed it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> but what we did was uh, we, uh, we, we, we changed the sensed information to make the robot hallucinating the VR world. It looks like you have oh. you have done something different, which is to put a fake world in front of the robot, right? Yes. A bit like Asian. Yeah, movies. these are like reversed or some, there's something different. I, I remember Marco was reading their paper and then. So, it was but, but, but can you, I'm not sure. So, between making a fake world for the robot or making a fake sense information for the robot, how would you compare the two options? What's the definition of making a fake world for the robot? That's different. This, this, this box you were... Right, okay, so, so if, I, if, I, um, if I put the robot up on a platform and let the wheels spin, is that your style or my style, do you think, of, of, of VR for robots? Uh, that, would, that's good. Yeah, that would be your style, I guess. I think so, I agree too. Yeah. So, so what would be your style in, in, in this kind of... Or, I'm trying to figure out if there's really a difference or... Uh, uh, yeah, that's so... But it, I'm trying to make it as close as possible to the way it is for the humans who use VR. That was our goal. But if you're thinking purely coming from a pure robotics perspective, there's probably other reasonable definitions as well, but that's at least our motivation. Yeah, so you would put the wood in front of the robot made of yes, made of paper. Because I fooled that sensor, yes. Yeah, and we would trick the, we would, we would like erase the sense information and replace it. By oh, okay, the okay. I, I consider that to be a, a BMI, a brain machine interface. Okay. Uh, because because that's equivalent to going in and like changing the signal somewhere inside yeah, or like maybe i just beam stuff to your optic nerve or something cut off your eyeball throw it away and, and do that not yours you know, somebody <laughs> one something. and, and um, um so so so, so that's that so we tried to make it non-intrusive like that but then for robotics it is easy to go in at all levels and and talk about that and then i think so so your view would i think cover then um what we would call vr for organisms and what we would call bmi for organisms as well brain machine interfaces and that's also, of course, why not study that? It's perfectly fine. Okay, that's the same way to. Uh, in okay, let's talk more about this. Yeah. Other the questions in the audience? Yep. Uh, I was just wondering if the uh, if you found if there was any insights um, from optical illusions and such, or what uh, for any kind of XR or uh, virtual reality technology. Insights into op, op, optical, illusions. optical illusion. Oh, I see. Like, are they helping you to? Well, I, you know, I, I think um, vision scientists are, are they, they love optical illusions. And, I, and I've, I'm told when they go, I've never made it to one of the vision science conferences, but every time they go and come back and talk to me, they say, I learned a new illusion there. They, they get all excited. It's like, it's like the demos or something you might see at SIGGRAPH or something like that. They get excited about new optical illusions because if they get stumped, then they have something new to study. And then they consider VR as another measurement device. And so if, if they can use VR to present stimulus in some way and control it very, very carefully, then um, that replaces what they would have done with like moving drums and all kinds of other things they've had to do to present stimulate, stimulus, visual stimuli to, to people in a controlled setting. So researchers are very excited about that. I don't have a good sense of like an overview of what's been done lately, but I know that they can, when I started talking with vision scientists and perceptual psychologists, they're very excited about VR as this extra way to, to, to provide stimulation in a, in a controlled way, much more than ever before. 
one thing that's really cool is if you look at something like a Vario headset with video pass through, it's very low latency and very high resolution. So you can do like the prism glasses experiment easily, or you can run Canny's edge detector easily and have an entire edge detected world while you walk around. It's bizarre. You can do so many cool things like that interfering with your, your direct, you know, direct vision. So, so there's a lot of good possibilities that will help, I think, scientists to understand and maybe even create new illusions. Um, but um, uh, how about the other way around? Has any has anything from uh, from these illusions helped in like making better VR systems? Um, I think we're relying on that all the time, in in, in some ways. Um, so, like um, as an example, there's some work at uh, Cambridge here in, in UK from a uh, Rafael Montiuk's group, where um, he showed that for VR, um, you can have every other frame be. I think it's. I think let me see. It's stereopsis but um, some of the frames can be at lower resolution. And he does it in a very specific kind of way that's exploiting the limitations in the human vision system. So, so what, what you basically are working with is when you understand the limitations of the human vision system, then it tells you things like what resolution do you need or what frame rate do you need? Like um, a flicker fusion thresholds is one good example of that. So, so do you perceive flicker? There's different thresholds at one level, say at 60 Hertz, you, most people can see flicker if, if, it's a, if it's like a CRT display or, a, or an OLED display or something. But then when it gets up to 80, 80 let's say 78 or something, then um, you might not perceive flicker, but it might still give you a headache. And then if it's up to like 90 or 100, then you don't get headaches and you don't perceive anything either. But it also varies across people. But then if you take a, if you take a blinking LED, I, I, if you have a blinking LED, if you have an LED around in your lab, and if you have okay, something a little more expensive, like a square wave generator, um, hook it up with a resistor and, you know, just, just like, and then, and then try it at different frequencies and then move the LED around. You, I, I was able to get it up to like two or 3000 Hertz and still perceive the blinking because it moves. And, and what it does is it makes like a zipper pattern on your retina. But if your eye is rotating with it, then you don't perceive it anymore. So it's all, so this, these kind of things I would argue have been going on for a long time, going all the way back to cinematography and, and lots of things like that. So. So, so, so that's a good question. I think it is, and hopefully we'll see a lot more of that. And if we can be more scientific about it in universities, maybe we can make good progress. That is a really nice sentence to end maybe this session. I said we will not go over three, it's three, five. So that's okay. not fair. <laughs>